This is the Serial at Midnight Podcast. Well, howdy and welcome to the Serial at Midnight Podcast. My name is Heath Holland, and this episode is such a treat for me because I'm talking to the lead singer of Romeo Void, Deborah Ayal. Now, what opened the door for this conversation is a brand new Romeo Void album that is arriving on Record Store Day, which is I'm recording this video and audio podcast, is uh, just a couple of days in the future. And uh, I really would like as many people as possible to go support their local record store to support independent artists. This is being distributed by Liberation Hall. It is a live album. It is live from the Mabuhay Gardens, uh, November 14th, 1980. Now, if you know your Romeo Void history, you know that this is before Now or Never. Uh, This is before their partnership, their collaboration with Rick Ocasek, the uh, wonderful producer, member of the Cars. Uh, This is before MTV. This is before everything that was about to happen. It is a a band that, as we learned in the interview, I don't want to tell you too much about what you're about to see, but I got to tease a little bit, right? Uh, This takes place about nine months into the lifespan of the band, and it captures a moment in time in the San Francisco punk, post-punk, new wave scene that uh, is really wonderful. So we get to hear about that in this interview. We also get to hear about uh, just some some tour stories, some things. That, what was it like to be on the road with Romeo Void in the 80s, singing with U2, uh, seeing Iggy Pop live? There's so much here for music fans, not just music fans, uh, but for people that really love pop culture and uh, just the arts in general. So uh, I had an absolute blast with this conversation. Um, this is one of, I'm going to, I'm, I don't know if I should say this, but this is one of my favorite interviews that I've done to date because it was such a, uh, just a deep, meaningful conversation. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So without further ado, Deborah Ayal. So this is a big deal. This is the first, you know, this release, this is what's opened the door for us is this new release from, um, here, let me. I'll get it. I'll hold it up here so people can get a really good look at it. But this is a brand new release. It's live from Mabuhay. Mabuhe, is it Mabuhay? Mabuhay. Mabuhe. Okay. Mabuhay Gardens. I want to talk about that venue too. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. But this is from November 14th, 1980. This is a record store day um, uh, release with. Does your, is yours color? Do I see it back there? Is yours that blue? It is. It's beautiful. I've it's, opened mine. Have you opened yours? Yeah. You got to listen to it. If you can't open it, if it's still sealed. I know. I just thought you could show it if you want. Ooh. Yeah. And see, because of how it's created, each one is completely unique. Well, now is, is somebody the who... liquid that it's made out of comes out, you know, a little differently on each one. As someone who's as um, artistic as you are. Yes. That's, that's a cool thing, right? That's you get, it's like a unique, totally one of a, each one is one of a kind. It is. Well, I'm also a printmaker. So I do some things that are additions in which you want them all to look as much the same as possible. But then I myself love to do one of a kind relief prints where I change the color of the ink or I change the viscosity of the ink. So there's two colors I can use using one process or another. And and so even though the image might be reproducible, each one is one of a kind. When did you first get so interested in art? Do you know, was there a moment like a, you know, shining light coming down from the sky? Well, (laughs) you know, probably like first grade, honestly. I remember talking during art and getting scolded by my teacher in first grade. And I literally had to sit in the corner on a stool with a dunce cap. Like you're probably too young to even know what a dunce cap is, except from the comics. But it really was a cone shaped hat you had to wear. And I forget what it said on it, but like, you know, something like bad student or something like that. And I really was so taken aback because I thought this is during art. I thought we could talk during art. So that's partly why I became an art teacher is because I wanted to be the teacher that I never had. I can match this is not I'm not going to match it, but I had a similar experience in kindergarten. I got paddled for coloring outside of the lines. Isn't that crazy? Yes. And at Sunday school, they got mad at me for um, coloring Christ green. 
but I was like in, yeah, I was like kindergarten or preschool. He had orange hair, you know, this is, you know, I'm a kid. Okay. okay. So I have to go down this, you've opened this door. I have to go down this door. So did the later at the time of Romeo Void and beyond, did that, is that kind of what helped shape the rebel, the rebellious spirit that kind of defined a little bit of your music? Do you think it was those early experiences of, of being like for me, being told the color inside the lines for you sitting in the corner in a dunce cap? This is unbelievable to me. That that's a, that's a, a shaping experience, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. The humiliation, you know, and I was honestly, you know, I adored school, you know, and teachers early on, mm -hmm. You know, by middle school, I had Sunday night anxiety because I hated it so much. But, you know, when I was smaller, you know, I wanted to learn. I was an inquisitive kid. You know, I liked talking. So, you know, having someone ask me things, you know, and learning things and showing off that I knew them, you know, that was all like really a wonderful experience for me. <laughs> but, you know, they don't, uh, when, when you know that something that you're doing is fine and other people are telling you it's wrong, then you do, you steal yourself against that. And like, I took my side, you know, mm -hmm. I knew it was wrong that she scolded me. And so I, I, I lived my life that way. Is this when you started with poetry or did poetry go back? You know, when did poetry become a major part of your life? say poetry was more like in my teen years okay you know um somebody who knows um you know because I was an avid reader my mother was an avid reader so I read all her books the Steppenwolf and the Alan Watts and Animal Farm you know I just was an avid reader whatever she would read I would read and then somewhere along the line someone bought me the book Naked Poetry which was, you know, sort of the Bible on free verse and like mm -hmm. beat poets. You know, it had like Galloway Canal in it and Denise Levertov and Allen Ginsberg, you know, a lot of the real writers of the time. And so I started reading all that and I wanted to take poetry classes. And so when I was 16, I actually quit high school after my sophomore year. And the very next year, I rode my bike over to Fresno State, got a schedule of classes, and showed up in poetry classes, even though I wasn't enrolled. And the teachers were like, well, wait, you're not on my roster. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just taking it because I want to learn. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I quit high school. <laughs> Don't tell anyway. Because <laughs> actually, school never contacted my mom. So I think they knew that we weren't a fit either because I had a pretty turbulent sophomore year yeah. um, and, and not for bad behavior against people or property or anything, but for just not conforming, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So poetry really struck me then and I would go to poetry readings and I saw Allen Ginsberg. I saw a lot of the poets that I just mentioned. I remember, Gwendolyn Brooks coming to Fresno State and, you know, just really inspiring me. Had yeah. you thought about setting those poems to music before? Not until Patti Smith. That's what we got to talk about Patti Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, a friend of mine, so, you know, go forward a few years from me taking classes at Fresno State. And I moved up to Humboldt County, partly just because a friend of mine did and was getting out of Fresno, it was up in the Redwoods. Mm -hmm. And I got a job there um, at Indian Action Council Preschool. And it was one of my earliest jobs in the area. And I was just gonna be a teacher's assistant. I thought, well, that's something I can definitely do. Um, and I had a high school diploma. I think that's all it required. Mm -hmm. And I mean, because I figured that out. Anyway, that's another story. Um, I got the job and I met the lead teacher and he was from New York City and he subscribed to New York Rocker. And so somehow very early on, his car broke down and I started picking him up you know, to take him to work and bring him home. And he'd invite me in to come and look at the magazines and come listen to the records. And do you know about television? Have you ever heard of Patti Smith? 
And so he's really the person who taught me about that. His name's Joseph Brooks. So we're still friends. So that's that's wonderful. Yeah. And we went to see Pat early Patty after horses came out together. So that was wonderful. And so you're, I, I mean, I don't want to, I know you've talked about this so many times. I don't want to belabor any points, but I know that that was transformative for you. And I also know, how, how did you end up? I guess what I'm curious about is how you end up in San Francisco and what's happening there at that moment, because it really feels like there was this window in time when it was just kind of blowing up, you know? Absolutely. So how I ended up there is while I was still in Humboldt County, I went to the Eureka 4th of July street party, mm -hmm. street fair. And wow. there was a place, you know, a booth there called the Indochina Friendship Booth. You, this puts it back in time. And um, I got a, a cookie, a fortune cookie, and it said, art is your fate, don't, don't debate. And I had already started to go see Patty Smith down in the Bay Area. And I, I thought, well, maybe I should go to art school. Because I didn't, I, I knew that college would be completely different than high school. And it was really the social situation and, and the conf, you know, enforced conformity that I really balked against mm -hmm. as far as education. But I didn't really actually mind learning. I liked it. So I thought, well, I'm going to apply for art school. And they asked me to write an essay because my um, I didn't have a typical diploma. I got a sort of like a certificate through a free school that some friends of mine were teachers at. <laughs> and so they said, well, you have to write an essay because we don't have your grade point average, you know, and that sort of thing. So I wrote some kind of essay and sent them some drawings and they accepted me. So that's how I ended up in San Francisco. And I applied to my tribe to get some help with the tuition. And they gave me like $900 a year for tuition and books. And at that time, you know, that would cover that education. Now I'm can't imagine how much it costs to go to school, but certainly not $900. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit more than that now. Yeah. So then, um, you know, I moved to San Francisco based on that. You knew that it was sort of a hotbed, right? I mean, you're going to see Patti yeah. Smith. And did you, had you attended shows at the Fab Mab at that point? You know, is that where, when did that come in? I did shortly after moving. Okay. Um, I remember one of the first bands I saw in San Francisco was when Talking Heads came through for Talking Heads 77. And they were playing slightly bigger venues than the Mabuhe but I knew about it from the local bands and also at the San Francisco Art Institute um, near the painting studios, there were lockers and Penelope Houston had quit going there the year before from the Avengers. And the lyrics to We Are The One were painted on what used to be her locker. So, I mean, I knew I was in the middle of, you know, mm -hmm. A, a wonderful thing when I saw that I was like this is exactly where I should be so I have something to say she was very inspiring actually when I saw her live as well so can you talk a little bit about that well I remember going to Mabuhe and, and hearing her sing and after seeing her lyrics written on her locker you know walking by it every day um I just thought you know she can do it I can do it I don't think I thought that so much after seeing Patti Smith because she had that real rock thing going on, you know, uh, you know, a different, you know, that sort of East Coast attitude and mm -hmm. she's skinny, you know. So in the rock world, um, you know, there is a body type that you're supposed to be to even just, you know, be admitted <laughs> to the stage. But, I, you know, punk rock was going to change all that. Mm -hmm. And so I, the writing was on the wall and somehow when I saw Penelope, I mean, she was, you know, had really short blonde hair at the time, bleached really blonde and stuff. But she also just really appealed to me as like a real girl, you know, just somebody I would know. So I can do it too. What about X-Ray Specs? I know you're a fan of them as well. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, of course, you know, I used to just stare at the album cover for a germ-free adolescence. 
you know, and dream of seeing her and seeing the band. And I adored her lyrics, Warrior and Woolworths and Oh, Bondage Up Yours, all of that. And so her attitude and just her pushing the boundaries of, you know, femininity and not having to sound pretty at all. Mm -hmm. and not having to write pretty songs at all. Well, I was really attracted to that and have been for a long time. Well, do you think we're kind of beyond some of these, <laughs> these, um, these expectations that women have to be pretty? Do you, have we gotten beyond that, do you think, or is it still a problem? I don't think we've gotten that far beyond it. You, if you're really exceptional, you know, for instance, Lizzo, you know, and you are really carving your own path with your own voice and your own message. You are so directed and talented and emphatic and unapologetic. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, reluctantly, there's a place for you. But I think, you know, if you just looks at, look at the shows like The Voice or American Idol or any of that, it's pathetic, you know. Yeah. First thing they do after they hear these wonderful singers is they start Hollywoodizing them and, you know, strapping them into these costumes and putting dancers behind them and all this other superfluous mm -hmm. to the music. That isn't why we listen to music, you know. Well, not why I do. I guess for some people it reinforces their cultural myopia you know how do you reconcile as an artist right you are literally an artist how do how do you reconcile your artistic integrity and what you want to create with this commercial side of the business and it's so much i feel like it's probably so much worse now than it was even when you were dealing with you know columbia records was you know not great to deal with i think i can say um how do you rec and and we're we're promoting a release here as well i mean there is a commercial side to art how does one reconcile you know balancing integrity with you know getting your art out there in the first place well i think it happens what is your intention you know we were always about we were trying to make art we weren't trying to make money we weren't trying to satisfy a need for attention or mm -hmm. you know ego satisfaction or show up you know, the other people, you know, we weren't in competition. It didn't seem to be the way of thinking that was really alive and vibrant at the time. Because if you think about it, the bands that I was seeing were wholly different from each other. The bands I was listening to, Magazine was completely different than the Buzzcocks or Susie and the Banshees or X-Ray Specs or X or Pylon or Television or the Talking Heads. None of those bands have any kind of regimented, you know, thing that they're trying to do. They're all really quite singular voices mm -hmm. and they come off that way. And that's their intention. So I always felt like as long as you're sort of true to like, what, are, what am I really trying to do here is make art, then it's carte blanche. That's good. When did you get on stage did, did the, the mummers and the poppers predate romeo void is that oh yeah yeah I and i that think came to be. being in that band helped me get on stage to do my own music because it broke the ice and also i had rachel was my sidekick we were like the two background singers mm -hmm. although i knew nothing about singing harmony nothing um but charlie mutant put the band together the bass player for the mutants uh, he was a student, I believe, in film or photography at the San Francisco Art Institute. And he just wanted the energy on stage. He wanted people to be having a good time. He wanted a great big band. And I think Rachel actually knew, you know, harmony and things like that. So I would just mimic what she was doing. Or even if she was doing something really high, I would try to come in low and I was just feeling it out. I listened to the records. I kind of knew you know what to do when we were singing background or lead we sang lead on a few songs like the boy from new york city it was a cover band yeah. kind of like the commitments that movie mm -hmm. it was like that we wanted to be an alternative to just that very detached sort of uh punk thing you know leaning against the wall in her all black outfit you know 
we were like, no, people should be dancing and having fun and meeting each other. You know? Wow. Yeah. How do you meet on the dance floor if you're too cool for school? You know, you don't. Yeah. You know, it was always my intention to like find like minds and find partners and things like that. So what what years are these that you're that you're doing this before Romeo Void? Is this like 78, 79? Yeah, yeah, I'm... exactly. Okay. Yeah, because I moved to San Francisco in 77, I think the fall of 77, perhaps. And in time to see Iggy Pop at the boarding house. Wow. I, I know I saw him at least two nights, but I'm pretty sure he played there for four nights. He's very big in San Francisco and so exciting. I bet. I bet that was amazing. Yeah. And that same club had that same year was like Mink DeVille and Ian Drury. So Sex and drugs and rock and roll. Yeah. I mean, and so like one year later, but in 1980, you're on the stage and, you know, listening to this now, it's you guys sound fully formed. You sound like you've been doing it for years, but that couldn't have been the case, right? This is, has to have been. No, maybe we were nine months or a year along. Benjamin was only a, about a month along into being in the band. Wow. Yeah. So he was still, I can hear him like finding his way, you know, and because some songs, we didn't really have a direction for him. We didn't have some, oh, play this horn line we've written. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just like, do what you can with what we're doing. We loved his attitude. We loved his skills and his ear. And he was obviously listening to us. You know, so he was a really good musician. And Frank and Peter, you know, kind of had their own um, synchronicity with the way they um, approached rhythm and melody. The bass line was often sort of the melodic root, you know. And then Peter would play around the chord rather than, you know, strumming big whole chords. Mm -hmm. So I remember a lot of times because I was a completely untrained musician. I would listen to the bass line to know, A, what key are we in and all that, and also when to come in, as his lines led so many of the songs. Well, how, how do you, when you've listened to this, right? You've heard Yeah, the, and you know what? We were pretty rehearsed. Yeah. We had some discipline. We knew that to sound the best, you had to stick with it. And so our whole attitude was that, Rehearse as much as you can and take every gig. So we would play warehouse parties, um, after hours parties, the smallest club opening for two other bands. We, you know, we were just, you know, just don't say no, say yes. That's a good philosophy in any area of life is just say yes and keep going forward. I'm still just looking for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what was, you know, when you when you listen to this, what does it make you feel? Where does it take you? Does it take you back to when it happened? It does. And it also, I mean, really, once I really realized, wow, this is really coming out, I better really listen to this, you know, because mm -hmm. at first I was just like, oh, you know, because part of me is a little dismissive, like that's the past. This I live in the now, you know, mm -hmm. I'm so above it all. Right. But um, <laughs> uh when I knew, oh yeah, this really is going to come out. They're asking us for, you know, artwork for the vinyl and uh, Frank supplied the beautiful Polaroids for the cover and all that. So many photos. And we got our friend Jack Fan to write the liner notes. And he was a really good friend of mine, still is. I still keep in touch with him too. Those are amazing uh, liner notes too. I just want to say they're they fantastic. I know it's worth the, the cost of the album just to read the liner notes yeah. and look at the artwork, I swear to God. So now I'm really grateful. I, I don't think I ever explained what I, when I finally did go listen back to the record, knowing it was coming out. The first thing I really felt was how grateful I was for the musicians I was playing with, for their permission and time to just find my way and contribute. They did not give me a lot of pressure about what I was gonna come up with. They liked it when I kind of winged it and came up with stuff on my own. So there was a lot of encouragement. And I'm sure at times 
it required a lot of patience. Because I can hear on the live record there places where I'm a little off from the band. And the band, what are they supposed to do? I'm just a little off. So they kind of get to the next section and hope and pray and maybe look at me and give me a cue where to come in right for the next verse. So I'm not off from them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that took a lot of patience and they could have like been really frustrated and want a quote unquote, a real singer, you know. Um, but no, they wanted somebody who had something to say and they were willing to um, indulge my deficiencies basically and help me learn. You know, I remember them at one point in time, it would just count the bars. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Tell me what a bar is. You know, I mean, really, seriously, I didn't know. Tell me about the audiences. It, what kind of crowds are you playing for? Also, like if you could, Dirk Dirksen, do you have any Dirk Dirksen memories? Because I've read stories. Dirk Dirksen was kind of a total jerk, but that was like his thing on stage to just yeah. make fun of everybody for everything. And, and, and that was just his way of being, you know, a little scuttlebutt against, you know, all the people who were supposedly so rebellious, you know, he'd just call them out, you know, but he, at the same time, he would like serve spaghetti early some nights because he knew not everyone was eating regularly wow. and everyone would welcome that, you know, Oh, come early and we'll have spaghetti, you know, things like That's that. Really cool. Yeah. Later yeah. he became very active in um, local youth organizations out in the mission district and helping with uh, recreational facilities and things like that. So he really was very community minded and he would always, at that point, he was obviously, um, you know, just drawn to being surrounded by people doing things. Because I remember going to events at the Recreation Center, you know, 10 years after Mabuhe wasn't even there anymore and um, seeing bands playing and he'd be serving food, you know, made by the community and things like that. So he was just this kind of person like that. He wanted to see the world progress and do his part so that was kind of who he was what else did you ask me i was curious what what the audiences were like and i also want to oh, know yeah. if there were women in the audience if there's a lot of you know uh a oh yeah lots of women um ginger coyote you know trans woman uh she was there all the time and um, Latinos, you know, the Zeros and all these different bands had kind of Los Microwaves, had mixed race bands, the Alley Cats, um, the Controllers, you know, so a lot of the punk bands that were around and on the stage had um, mixed race players and mixed genders and, and, and versus one of the best um, bands was mostly female players with uh, Olga de Volga. Anyway, if you look it up, she's pretty amazing. And I think she played bass. Anyway, so that was who was there. So a lot of people were pretty young, you know, mm -hmm. not a lot of oldsters in the crowd. And then there were people that would be new, you know, that you'd see, you know, fresh from the suburbs. But then, you know, as they came to the club more and more, pretty soon they'd move into town and get a job at one of the copy places, you know, like repro graphics type thing. And um, then you'd see them and they'd have a new punk haircut and they'd show up at the club, you know, in a leather jacket. And then pretty soon they'd be starting a band. And like you sort of remembered when they came with their bell bottoms and their shag haircuts, you know. So you, you saw people transition as well. And there were plenty of like gay people who were around and in bands. Um, Don Vinell from the Offs, you know, was a good friend of mine. And he had, I don't know, some association with the Angels of Light, which was kind of a, a theater group that was big in San Francisco and often utilized drag performance and, and sort of um, infusion of like a guy in a dress with a beard kind of thing. Um, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence is an organization. Um, they're still super active and they're one of the biggest contributors to 
um, all kinds of social programs. So a lot of these wonderful people came together because of being outside the box, but they were very community minded. What, when I think when I say the word, the name Rick Ocasek, what do you think? Is it positive feelings? Is it joy? Is it? Oh yeah, yeah. He was awesome. He was very kind of soft spoken, not a man of many words. When he was in the studio, he kind of sit back, all folded up like origami. You know, he was tall and very thin, and he'd just fold himself up in a big old chair and listen. And then he'd lean over once in a while and talk to the engineer. Or when someone was through playing their part, if they were doing overdubs, he'd, you know, pull over and, and very privately say something about their performance, probably, you know, positive and maybe a suggestion, you know, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And that was certainly how he dealt with me, with my vocals, because, you know, he produced the EP, Never Say Never. And... I'm sure there were times when he wanted me to try different things and, and he had such a respectful attitude toward just the creative process. And I remember wondering, is it going to be appropriate to work with him? Except when I found out he had produced suicide and I'm like, Oh, well then he's fine. He loves what we're doing, you know, because I thought he's so pop and so popular you know, come on, the cars, you know, they yeah. were on the radio all the time with so many hits. You know, how's that going to work with us? And and it, it worked wonderfully because he supported us. Yeah, it's very supportive. What sort of notes was he giving you on your vocals? Oh, like, so sometimes there's this thing called doubling where you sing over yourself. Mm -hmm. And so his big trick for me was to sing the first version kind of straight, you know, just sing the melody, stay on the rhythm. You know, it's sort of a term that you use also for when you're recording without a lot of effects, you know, mm -hmm. you want to sing it kind of straight. And then the second time when you're overdubbing it, add some of that sass and, you know, uh, more emphatic and more kind of, for lack of a better term, sort of more screechy, you know, and, you know, so when you hear my voice, you get to hear both of those things, you know, the, the straight version and that other second doubling voice mixed together. And then it's easier for your ear because you really do your, the part of your mind that latches onto melody still has that. And yet this other voice that's doubling it is giving you more of the emotional content. And he's a great, I mean, he's a legendary producer now. We yeah. look back on Rick Ocasek's career and we're like, look at all the stuff that he did. Um, that's fantastic. How, now or never, so there's a radio edit. How do you feel about, you know, you met you, again, this is the art, you write a song and then, well, we're gonna take this and we're gonna modify it a little bit and then we'll put this out and then this will be the Alma version. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, um, you know, we knew that when we were going to make a video for Never Say Never, because it was going to go on TV, that they would have to cover up the F-bomb in Never Say Never. But they, that one of the suggestions was that I come up with another word, or they just sort of excise the word, you know, mm -hmm. and instead what was decided was just to put a really loud snare hit on it, <laughs> you know, and so it's just kind of like, well, you know, it, I could, I could handle it. They were, I wasn't being told the main lines of the song were wrong or my mm -hmm. approach was wrong. It's just this one forbidden word. So I pretty much made a point of live always singing it so you could hear it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm just enough of a brat that way. You're, you're no, you're you're just you're yourself, and you don't want to mod you don't want to change who you are for you know, yeah to be or like when we were on American Bandstand, we're lip syncing, but I kind of want the crowd to know. I know we're lip syncing. Mm -hmm. So at one point I'm singing into the microphone and then I turn off to like, look at Frank or Peter or Benjamin and I'm still singing the song, not into the mic at all. 
So uh, like I'm showing that, yeah, we're in on this. We're, we're lip syncing. I love that. I love that though. That's what people so like. The next time you see that American bandstand thing, you'll see me do that. And that was like purposeful. Yeah. How did you meet Dick Clark? Did you have any interaction with Dick Clark? How was it? I really liked it. <laughs> really? Yeah, you know, he was really fun, you know, and he was so respectful. He came around and introduced himself and got the enunciation of everybody's name, which is, you know, one of the most respectful things you can do. Mm-hmm. When I was a high school art teacher, I remember a student coming to me in December and, and you know, she just sort of wanted to talk or whatever. And she wanted to tell me that I was important to her, you know, which is a great thing to hear from a high school art student, you know, this very big important thing that somebody's willing to tell you um and she said you're the only teacher that says my name right oh you know yeah so yeah. i mean those things are lasting and important and, mm-hmm. and i i took that to heart when i became a teacher you know say their names right learn their names for one and then say them right so that's that's and by december true. Hey, teachers, you should have it down, you know. <laughs> My wife's a teacher. She's actually an administrator oh, okay. now. But so she, I, I, you're, you're, you're preaching the gospel right now. Like that's absolutely true. Um, yeah. The, so this is the era of MTV. And how, could, like, I don't know that, you know, young people now, like we have YouTube and some of these, like a Taylor Swift video gets like 17 billion views or something like that. But MTV at the time could really put a band on the map and it could really help to establish because it's the, it's the music and the image married together and it could really do something for you. Did you? And it did a lot for Romeo Void. We were on tour when MTV was happening. And I remember going into a town and all of us finally were staying in a motel where they had MTV and we all got to watch it for the first time together. And we watched it and watched it wanting to see ourselves. And we did. I mean, who knows how many hours it took, you know, but us and Bow Wow Wow were big. And um, I think like Video Killed the Radio Star was also one of the early videos. Mm -hmm. And suddenly in all the towns that had MTV, the kids knew all the lyrics. They knew what we looked like. And, you know, kind of broke down this big barrier, honestly you know, to have them have that familiarity, not just from hearing us sit in a club or on college radio, you know. So we, we garnered a lot more fans. And I would say, judging from a post I read maybe two days ago from Alice Bag, she was talking about her early career and the diversity of the punk scene and all that kind of things really, very cool post that she put on Instagram. And then somebody replied to her, I was reading all the replies and somebody said, I'm a plus size singer and my local clubs won't book me because of my size. What do you suggest? And I thought, same as it ever was. That's what we were talking about just like 20 minutes ago. Yeah, you know, some people are just, you know, are, Defiantly bigoted, you know, that's how I think of it. And um, I I wanted to write back to her, but I honestly really didn't know what to say. I remember before going into a club, even though we like played till 2 a.m. the night before, got up at like eight or nine to drive seven hours to this town we arrived at getting ready to go into sound check. I remember putting on makeup before I went into sound check to get more respect from the club, from the bartenders, from the sound guys, you know? Otherwise they were kind of like, she's in the band, you know? So at least if I had like oh, my look <laughs> yeah. for whatever it is, I mean, we were pretty casual art school student, you know, look, you know? I, I at least look like, you know, I'm purposeful in, in this aspect. And, and yes, I am the singer. It gave me a little more authority. <laughs> okay. So, so, so you, but you guys toured from 80 to 84, pretty, pretty consistently, right? Where did, what was the, 
what were the towns like you know with it did you find different areas were more receptive different areas were more you know parts of the country might have been a little more progressive than other parts of the country do you have places you wanted to go good experiences bad experiences that's what i want to know about yeah well yes for sure there were towns where there was really strong college radio you know so mm -hmm. um you know, there were towns that, you know, you you look on the map and wonder about it. Chapel Hill, North Carolina comes to mind. And you're like, hmm, Chapel Hill, what is that going to be? And it turns out there's huge colleges there. Um, there's tons of bands already playing. Pylon and REM and all those B-52s come through this town regularly. Mm -hmm. People are very familiar with all kinds of bands and music. The promoter wants to put you up at their house, you know, to help you save money on a motel. You know, so you just don't know, honestly, sometimes until the first time you're there or the first time you go to college radio in the town. So I would definitely say a lot of towns that had that really strong presence of college radio were always way more susceptible. Or um, we would play gay clubs, like gay dance clubs. And those were, you know, really good towns for us. The people knew they could dance to our music. The audience was, you know, skewed you know, in our direction, as far as, you know, um, wanting to have fun and, and push boundaries and, you mm -hmm. know, don't be like everybody else, you know, so there was a lot of acceptance for my size and my look and, you know, my brownness, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then um, I remember once, the first time we played near Austin, Texas, we got booked into a club out in the suburbs of Austin, where they had like a working mechanical bull. <laughs> and the audience, we walk in to do sound check and they're a for one thing, they were very reluctant to turn off the country music so we could sound check because there were patrons in the bar during our sound check, which is very, very unusual. Usually, in most clubs we were playing, they didn't open until, you know, it was doors, right? But this was more like a bar. So, you know, we're like having to, you know, beg to have someone turn on the monitors or, you know, the show us where the equipment was for the lights and that sort of thing. Um, and the audience that came la that night wasn't that big, but all the people who came were telling us, why are you playing here? You know, the booking agent obviously had the wrong idea. Maybe he got a better offer from that bar than he would have downtown in Austin. Because the next couple of times we played there, we played there with Translator, great audience, you know, down in Austin. Next time we played there, we played with The Fall. You know, so those were the right venues. But then when we played these suburb places, it was kind of like you were just hoping that, you know, nothing would break out against the band in the audience, you know. I remember us when we would drive, you know, being really cautious about speed, going through towns and not wanting to get pulled over by the police and sometimes getting pulled over and having like everything searched. You know, they would want us to pull all the amplifiers out and they'd be looking in the amplifiers with their flashlights while we're waiting in the van. You know, don't leave, don't go anywhere, don't move. You know, why they're checking all our stuff, you know, because they wanted to get us on something. And I remember one place when we got pulled over for probably a speeding ticket, you know, going 55 and a 45 going through town at midnight or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the cop was like we thought you just took a ticket and then send the money in he was like no you need to come down to the police station and pay it now and so we were like none of us wanted to go into the police station are you kidding you know yeah. i don't remember exactly where we were though it was somewhere between new orleans and chapel hill you know was your manager with you for all this well we had a road manager so he's probably the one who had to go. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's his job. That's what he's supposed to do is go take care of that. So you guys don't have to all pile into the it's like an episode of the Andy Griffith show or something where you have to go down to the courthouse and stand in front of the guy. Um, the person that lined this interview up just shared a picture of um, 
of you singing with you two and I have to ask you about that what was that like well it was beautiful <laughs> really <laughs> honestly they were very nice to us um the guy from 415 records who you know signed us and was our biggest fan at 415 um, he had all these connections and that was to get us to open for you two the very first time they came through town they played a smaller venue that maybe hold held 250 300 people and they liked us as a band mm -hmm. so the next few times we played was like kind of at their request they wanted to play with us again. They liked our audience and they liked who we were and what we were playing and they liked our music. And so they're very gracious. Um, and, you know, I was kind of starstruck, you know, because Bono's just such a good performer, you know, and the band just seemed, you know, very uh, focused and Edge was, you know, so impressive. And, you know, and they had their big banner, you know, for Boy. And I remember, wow, why don't we have a banner like that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> these guys really know what to do, these Irish people, you know, to make a great show. So we played with them quite a few times. And I have to tell you this one very poignant scene. So we have played, we're, you know, every time they came through town, we played a little bit bigger venue opening for them. So one of the last times that we opened for them was at the Bill Graham Civic Center which probably holds, you know, maybe 8,000 people. I mean, it's very, very large. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying to get into sound check and all these people, you know, who are doing security for the venue were not letting me in. And I'm like, I'm in the opening band. I'm the lead singer. And they're like, they weren't having it. And I'm like, finally, I just said to one of the security guards, I'm like, Somebody's going to be really mad if you don't let me in because I'm really supposed to be here for sound check like 15 minutes ago. And I'm just trying to get into this menu. So go check with whoever you need to, but you need to get me in. So finally they let me in. And so I'm feeling rushed and late and agitated and kind of like, oh God, you know, what am I doing? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh so I open up a door because the guy goes, go right through there. And I'm like, okay. And I don't know where it's going into because I'm not even familiar with this venue. I don't think I'd ever seen a band there because I was going to clubs. I wasn't going to big shows. And I open up the door and it's the venue. And you two's on stage doing their sound check. And so I just kind of go striding into the room and it's empty except for the sound crew and the band. And Romeo Void and our crew is all backstage, so I don't see any of them. So I'm just kind of walking in, kind of trying to decide how to find my way backstage or something. And Bono starts singing, I will be with you again. And I'm just like, oh, he's singing to me. <laughs> You know, but he recognizes me and this is this moment that I'm going to remember my whole life. Yeah. And of course, here it is all these years later and I'm kind of getting a little tear in my eye just remembering it. It's so sweet. That is very sweet. Any other, who did you, what are some of the other bands that you got to tour with? And do you have any other stories about the sharing a bill? Yeah, I do. Actually, um, there was a great show on Halloween night out sort of like Corvallis in Oregon. So there's a college town and then there's this other town like Corvallis that's near it, not a college town. And we were, some students were the organizing committee and the promoters. So it wasn't, a, you know, typical promoter that's, you know, does this all the time and has all different kinds of bands. It was the students who were, you know, doing this very special show. And they organized it at a Grange Hall. And it was with X. And so we were going to be opening for X. And I always loved X. And I, you know, like memorized all their lyrics. And when our love passed out on the couch. And, you know, let's not talk about bombs and the brain impulses of severed limbs. You know, I was all into X. And um, 
So I'm super excited and I walk into the Grange Hall and it's, you know, all wood and, you know, the promoters are these guys who are, you know, five years younger than me, you know, and we're introducing them and they're all kind of like, you know, fans as well. So they all had this super high energy and it was Halloween. So we're like, okay, this is a real opportunity. And somebody, one of the, either our road guy or their guy says, I think we should line the front of the stage with pumpkins. So they went out and got a pumpkin for each one of us in both bands and all the road crew to carve pumpkins that afternoon. And they put candles in them all along the front of the stage. And us as a band were like, kind of want to really step up to the moment. We got a little competitive almost like we want to make it hard for X to come on after us. <laughs> we're going to give them everything and we're not selling beer. We're playing for an audience who people just love the music, you know? And um, so when we go out to do our set, we do our whole entire set and, and Romeo Boyd used to like to play a long time. So our set would be maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And then we always had like two or three songs for encores. Sometimes it'd be a song we were working on. Sometimes it'd be songs, you know, just didn't always necessarily fit in the set or whatever. And we'd play them, you know. And so that night, that's what we did. I remember coming off the stage completely drenched in sweat, having had the time of my life, you know, honestly, performing for the band X too. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to show them I knew what I was doing and I had something to say, you know. I mean, we really wanted to, you know, leave an impression and give it our best. And then Did they you? came on. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, anyway, so we went backstage and they were kind of like, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, now we're going to watch you, you know. And so then they were like, we got them all hyped. Like, you know, we were telling them how much we couldn't wait to see them and, you know, da, da, da. At this point, you know, when you're on tour, a lot of bands leave, you know, mm -hmm. like during your set, if you're opening for them, they did their sound check, then they go to dinner or they go back to the hotel or whatever. They don't mm -hmm. stay and watch you, but they were watching us and we stayed and watched them. And I remember after the show, hanging out in the back while they're unloading all the equipment, everyone's just talking and hanging out, you know, and there's orchards nearby and uh, fields of you know crops and stuff and all the kids are leaving in their cars and it's just being super special Halloween night that's great I was, yeah, I was I thinking I was thinking the pumpkins weren't going to survive but it sounds like they all came through it fine oh yeah I mean I think everyone was delighted to come out and see this all along because you know there are five people in our band plus we had sound man and the road manager so that's like seven pumpkins just from our crew their crew was maybe one more person than us mm -hmm. you know so we're talking like 15 pumpkins across the front of the stage all with candles in them you know, were there are there any photos of this uh I doubt it because it wasn't that time right that isn't what we did. I have photos of almost nothing <laughs> from those years, honestly. Yeah. Which is yeah. kind of amazing that there's tape of the, um, that the shows that the, you know, that, that this record exists because tape, I think there's three, you can tell me, but I think there's three surviving tape recordings of, um, of the early days of the band. And that's kind of a miracle that those exist too, because I don't think that's what people were thinking. Yeah. It's the sound man. Terry Hammer from Mabuhe, he just recorded everybody. Um, and so he has lots of them. I remember him contacting me in the 90s, letting me know, well, I've got these great tapes, you know, so he sent me them and probably listened to him once and thought, well, good, you know, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do from him now, all these years later after we broke up, but, yeah. you know, then to find out later how he, you know, got them you know, Liberation Hall interested and got them released. I'm completely impressed. They have quite good sound quality. You know, it sounds amazing. It, I mean, yeah. it really sounds like you can hear and then the songs are over and you just hear like, you hear like the clap. It sounds like, you know, it's right there. So having never seen the inside of the venue, I don't know, but it sounds like it was a very kind of an intimate venue. 
Yeah, for sure. Maybe to help 200 people. Okay. It used to be a supper club. So didn't have a high ceiling or, you know, um, there was only one little section in the back that was like two stairs up and it was like a little mezzanine that still had little cocktail tables, you know, but the rest just got cleared out. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to be very respectful of your time. So I'll, I wanted to talk about your solo career, but I'm going to turn, instead of doing that, I want to ask, so how, I know you're still, I mean, the music is still an active role in your life. I know you're still creating music. Talk to me a little bit about what you're doing with music right now. Okay. So I literally have in my printer right now a little flyer. Don't zero in on it too much because I don't want everyone to know my address, but okay. we're having a front yard concert oh, wow. in my hometown. I moved to uh, Raton, New Mexico, and my husband and our friend and carpenter who helped us fix up this house a year ago when I retired from teaching um, he's a guitar player and we do cover songs and I'm very pointedly doing cover songs because it's like I've written a lot of original songs I've written a couple of solo records you know dialogue was one and knife in water was one and stay strong was one had very little impact on much of anyone but you know I wrote a lot of songs and now I just want to sing songs you know, and so it was the kind of thing where they'd be working on the house during the day and at night, um, Aaron would get out his guitar, my husband's a drummer, and he'd get out his bongos or his little percussion things. And in the living room, we just started learning songs. And when we did it, I said, we need to learn 100 songs. Because if we want to go out and play, then we need to have a lot, lot to choose from. Well, I think we've learned at least 40 now. And we're even recording them because my husband's an audio engineer, too. So, yeah. you know, that's his art form completely. So we have some songs and we're hoping to attract someone to put them out in the next while, you know, maybe next year for Record Store Day. Who knows? Ooh, I like uh, that tease. What, yeah. what sort of songs are you playing? Like just okay. Don't give me so you some of my list. favorites. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I was always one of those people who I did like the real emotional slower songs. Like I mean it, instincts are some of my favorite songs from Romeo Void. And then so I learned didn't want to have to do it from Love and Spoonful. Love and Spoonful, yeah. Although I do sort of do the version, Cass, um, Cass Elliot's versions, a little mm -hmm. jazzier and very much leans into the waltz, you know, rhythm of the song. Very, you know, heartfelt, touching song. Um, Fade Into You, Black. You know, so Pearl Jam, Massey Star, wow. Cass Elliott, um, Johnny Rivers, Poor Side of Town, um, Johnny Cash, I Still Miss Someone. And then we have some that are more fun and rockers like um, Blood and Roses, Smithereens, um, Sugar Shack by the Fireballs, which are from Raton, New Mexico. One of the fireballs lives right up the street from me. He's really good friends for my with my neighbor across the street. We're hoping he comes to our front yard concert. Um, yeah, so I consider the material we're doing is the songs of the last millennium. And I definitely feel like I am a mid-century modern. You know, oh, I, I definitely come from the 20th century with my influences and my uh, what shaped me and what music I loved. I mean, I'm even thinking of learning like Sandy Shaw's Girl Don't Come. You know, it's like from 1962, you know. Yeah. Well, um, OK, hold on. So that's a transition because on this on this record release, you guys do a cover the the the. Um... The encore is Double Shot of My Baby's Love. And I know yeah. you have a special connection with that song. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, um, that was the first 45 I bought with my own money. Because, you know, our mom would take us to the store with her, you know, she, five and dime Rudy's. And, you know, I remember her making sure we got one of the first Beatles records and 45s. And we had 45s that were the Beach Boys and the Vogues. You remember Five O'Clock World? Well, maybe you don't, but I do. Oh, I love um, this stuff. Yeah, well, go ahead. Go anyway, ahead. the first one I bought with my own money was Double Shot of My Baby's Love by the Swing of Medallions. And I was very titillated and excited by 
it was such a thrill, it was hurting me, right? And so I wanted to do that as our cover song. <laughs> and the guys were like, sure, you know, it kind of rocks out and, you know, why not? And it's very like, um, it fits with the Romeo Void material, honestly. Yeah, and you don't change the gender. So it's got this provocative kind of aspect to it. That's just a little, yeah. ooh, you know, it's got the, is there a rule for what, what attracts you to a cover, to a cover song? Like, how do you choose what makes a good cover? I don't know. You know, okay. I actually, one of my favorite songs we do, I never knew before, but it was one my husband wanted to do, which was the Jayhawks waiting for the sun. And whoa, I love that song now, but I had to learn it. And another suggestion that didn't come from me was Sentimental Lady. Um, Fleetwood Mac is known for doing it. Okay. Um, but the Autumn Defense did it a few years back for Record Store Day. There's a really good version of it on YouTube by the Autumn Defense, which is like, this was probably in the early 2000s that they did it, <clears throat> but I really love that song now. So I'll take suggestions. And then, you know, I don't know, it's just songs that I always really liked. Mm -hmm. And then some songs that we do are a little silly, like we're doing Sugar Shack, you know, but I also really love R.E.M. So we're, we already learned Don't Go Back to Rockville, but now we're learning South Central Rain. So... I don't know. It's very good. Well, I hope that, that it, it I has to be able to carry off by three instruments, drums, guitar, and voice. So that limits us quite a bit because we don't even have a bass player. We don't have a keyboard player. We don't have a lead guitar, you know, so there, we have some limitations. And I, I think that's why we also are able to lean into some Tom Petty, you know, I didn't, Back in the day, I would be a real snob about Tom Petty because he was too successful and, mm -hmm. you know, it just sounded too straight. Um, but now I love Tom Petty and I love to sing his songs. So we do You Got Lucky. Um, we do Breakdown and Stop Dragging My Heart Around. So the Raton 3. I hope it works out. So, Art, you, you're are is there anywhere? Have you had a, a an exhibit? Have you had a show? Is there anywhere? I did can last summer. I had an art show, Punk Painters, with Penelope Houston of the Avengers and Judy Gittleson from Inflatable Boy Clams. They had a song called "I'm Sorry." It's really big on college radio at one point. Um, anyway, we all had an art show together. Um, Judy Gittleson from the Inflatable Boy Clams. Um, it has a gallery now down in Watsonville, which is like sort of a agricultural um, area just south of the Bay Area. And so she asked me and Penelope if we wanted to all have a show together. We all, you know, came from the San Francisco Art Institute, too. So a lot of the alumni, of, you know, our time came down to the show to see it and everything. That was just last summer. So I'm still doing artwork. Um, see behind me, you can see something on my table. That is this silhouette cutout thing I did for the holidays and put on my front windows. And it's a bunch of deer and trees and things like that. And then I'm getting ready to decorate my windows for spring because also we're having this concert. So I'm gonna do a bunch of sort of Giorgio O'Keefe flowers, you know, big cutouts of brightly colored flowers. And, you know, I make regular sort of um, narrative art, you know, as well. And if you follow me on Instagram, D, period i-y-a-l-l -L, no capitals um you'll see my art you know i don't think i'm you know the greatest artist to ever live or anything like that but you, you can definitely see my fascinations you know and and what my love of color and that sort of thing so is there anywhere else you want people to go to to yeah, any other no that's pretty much on? my social media is instagram i like it because people don't talk too much <laughs> they just like your things yeah. you know i was on facebook and it got argumentative and and i also was able to finally look up you know find out what bots you have interacted with what bot accounts 
And I had interacted with a bunch of bot accounts, mostly over Standing Rock, because I'm still very interested in, in Native American um, activists and environmental causes and, and all that. And so when uh, Standing Rock occupation was happening, you know, with the water protectors against the um, oil, gas, you know, and gas lines coming through South Dakota, and I, you know, followed all that. And, and that's how I actually inter interacted with a bunch of bot accounts, because they're just trying to foment discord. And some of the accounts are even, you know, saying my side, you know, of the argument. Um, and so that's when I got off Facebook. Because I thought, no, I just, you know, I can't, I don't want to be manipulated that much. And mostly on Instagram, I follow a lot of art teachers and other musicians and stuff. Yeah. That I'm gonna to have to go check that out now to see if I'm following bot if I'm engaging with bots or not because I haven't even thought about that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, uh, I forget where you could look it up, but when it when it was you know uh, happening topic to really realize who you were interacting with online, you know, and sort of check your sources kind of thing. And I found out I'm like, well, I got to get off this. So it wasn't more than a few weeks after that. That's crazy. Uh, I'm going to hit this one more time because I want people to okay. know about it. So this is a Record Store Day uh, release. But my understanding is that after Record Store Day, this is going to get a different pressing. Is that uh, Does that sound like something you've heard as well? I would love that to happen. I'm not sure it'll be on the blue vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. after this, we just go to black vinyl, I think. Um, and you can also buy downloads or um, CDs. You can sign up for pre-orders on Bandcamp. So band, go to Bandcamp, look up Liberation Hall slash Romeo Void, and it'll come right up. So if you want to pre-order a CD or digital downloads, and then those will be available, you know, after Record Store Day. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but this comes highly recommended. It's a great release, and I'm very thankful for it because it opened the door for me to talk to you. So well, I've really enjoyed our talk. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time to you. talk to me. Well, there you have it. That's a really, it's a fascinating conversation to me because we, it went to so many interesting places. I wasn't sure exactly what we were going to get to talk about or how much time I was going to have. And to get such an insight into, like, I really feel like you come away from this interview seeing Deborah's soul. And there was a, I don't know how to even describe it. That Like, I love her. She is so easy to be around you know people talk about energy or whatever the energy is just so calm and peaceful and uplifting and, and warm and supportive i can't describe it but i bet that a lot of you guys felt it too because you got to spend the time that i got to spend with her we got to share that together so uh, remember the album is romeo void live from abuhe gardens november 14th 1980 it is a record store day uh, release April 22nd, 2023, 11 tracks. A couple of these tracks have uh, never found their way to a Romeo Void album. And then, of course, there's that cover version of Double Shot of My Baby's Love by the Swingin' Medallions uh, that we got to hear the story behind. So um, it's a really fun release. I've listened to this multiple times. I've only had it for a little while, but I have listened to it multiple times because it's just such a fun snapshot of uh of a scene that was really blowing up at the time and uh it's incredible that it's captured no like this interview it's captured here and we get to experience it whenever we want so i want to thank deborah Ayal for the uh for being so forthright for for being so generous in multiple ways and uh, I want to th folk thank the folks at Liberation Hall for making this happen. So, uh, guys, please remember to rate, review, subscribe, thumbs up, comment, whatever you can do to support this podcast. Uh, that's how we grow. That's how people find this thing is by you engaging, you engaging. So thank you. I appreciate you. Until next time, I will catch you 